Today we've got a crazy nuclear revenge story about falsifying some test results. We'll get into that in a bit, but first, teaching my roommate a lesson. I've been seeing the new thread on crappy roommates and boy, do I have a juicy tale. I'll preface by saying that although I absolutely hated it when I lived with my family or in the school dorms, no one was as bad as my so-called best friend. I come from a really big family. Both my parents were married really young, my mom at 15 and my dad at 19, and they both had kids from their previous marriages that were somehow both abusive because they got married to people who were over a decade older. My mom had one son and my dad had twin daughters. After their respective divorces, my dad's ex-wife ran away and left him with the babies, while my mom got custody of her son. They met when my mom was 24 and my dad was 28 and instantly hit it off with each other. Only three months later, they got married and had six more kids, rounding all of us to a whopping nine. Nine whole children. I don't know what they were thinking, but they clearly weren't thinking straight. My family's always been a happy-go-lucky family, which has always weirded me out because I'm very melancholic and prefer my own company. But the universe played a fast one and made me a middle child, so I was constantly surrounded by siblings. And my parents paid little to no attention to me, which I didn't really mind. I liked having my own space whenever I could. I didn't make many lasting friendships in high school, which is a nicer way of saying I had no friends. So I made sure all of my plans were abroad and far from my family. I traveled for about a year after high school ended and then went off to college. I was bummed that I had to live in the dorms with roommates. So I worked two jobs alongside school so that I could make enough money to rent my own place immediately after my first year. I ended up staying longer and moving into my own place after my second year because I made friends. Yes, you heard that right, I made friends. Everyone on my floor was so cool and in no time I was very good friends with them. Most of them were traumatized by life in very similar ways to me, so it felt like our traumas brought us together. It was also then that I realized how traumatized theater kids really are. Hug a theater kid today. Anyway, of everybody I met, there was one girl who stood out to me the most. I'll call her Emma. Her room was right opposite mine and we shared a few classes together, so we would walk each other to classes in the mornings, and sometimes we would also walk each other back if we happened to run into each other at the end of the day. Before long, it became our little ritual. We would walk each other to class in the mornings, grab coffee together, and if we had time, have breakfast. From that, it graduated to always getting lunch together, or waiting for each other at a nice spot in the courtyard if classes were running late. In all the classes we shared, we always had seats next to each other. My favorite part of our relationship was the fact that there wasn't a strong need to talk all the time. We could be quiet together and still have a really good time. Emma was a really beautiful girl, as was I. I still am, so when we were together, we usually got comments about how pretty of a couple we were. Being the mischievous people we were, we found it funny and played along, making up stories about our fake relationship. On her 21st birthday, Emma's friends insisted that we go to a bar. I went along because she was my friend too, and dressing up for one night wasn't going to kill me. After a few shots, everyone was in a really good mood and dancing like crazy, until Emma signaled to me that she needed a break. We went to the bathroom and stayed there for over 10 minutes, just talking about how much we wished that we could ditch and just go home because of how tired we were, and a couple of drunk strangers walked in, about 5 of them. While one girl was puking her guts out, the other four just kept repeating to us how gorgeous we were and how they thought we were the most beautiful couple. We tried to explain that we weren't actually a couple, but these extreme people seemingly weren't having it and wanted to convince both themselves and us that we were in an aggressive lesbian relationship. After they had left, a switch flipped in both between us. We started to make out and one thing led to another and Emma and I ended up in her dorm room. The morning after was silent, but after we shared one look, I could tell that whatever this was, we would be doing it more often, but in all honesty, I didn't mind it. It was also a shocker to me that I was queer. While there was no closet, I hadn't actively been attracted to women before. I'd had crushes on a few guys here and there, but never really a woman. It didn't matter though, because Emma was patient and ready to teach me, as long as I was ready to learn. It wasn't too long before Emma became the only person I spoke to. She was my best friend and girlfriend in one. And although we had no labels, I didn't think she and I needed labels. 
But apparently we weren't anything too serious. And I found out the hard way when we were dragged out to a mutual friend's birthday and someone asked if we were together. I nodded and Emma scoffed, giving a look that said, me and her? Be serious. I was hurt. And after the incident, I distanced myself from her. Around the same time, I moved out of the dorms into my own place. It was a nice little apartment and I moved in during the summer, so it was really convenient for me. It was convenient for Emma because she came back around and wanted to begin messing around again. I didn't want to when I let her know, but somehow she was able to destroy my willpower with a sob story about her life. I had never known her to be that type for sob stories and we hadn't spoken in a few months, so I accepted her word as true and invited her back into my life. For the rest of summer, Emma and I's lives revolved directly around each other. We basically lived in my new apartment together and did everything together. I didn't mind it for the first couple of weeks, but with time I started to want my own space. I didn't want to say anything till school started back up because I assumed that she would take the hint and move back to school. However, when school started up again, Emma started to slowly move herself into my place. Unable to keep it in, I decided to confront her and it turned into a three hour sob session about how her roommate was an absolute jerk and she was broke and couldn't afford an apartment of her own. It stressed me out, but I decided to help. However, I made sure to be specific that I could only really help for about three months because I liked my space and I didn't want our friendship to suffer because of it. Emma seemed really grateful, especially since I wasn't making her pay rent or anything at all, just so she could save from her job for her own place. The first month passed and it was good. It felt like our old dynamic since we were doing everything together again, almost like we were in a whole relationship. Whenever I tried to bring up the what are we question, she avoided it like the plague. After some time I got the hint and started associating with her as normally as possible. Whenever she would try to start something with me, I shut it off immediately, not wanting to go past the friendship level until we could define what we were. Maybe it upset her, which is weird because I believe that I should have been the upset one, but Emma changed in the blink of an eye around the second month. She stopped speaking to me directly and only barely communicated through text. She started to bring strange people into my space, and while I didn't care what she was doing, it greatly discomforted me. Like a civil human, I tried to speak to her about finding it discomforting that she brought so many people over to my house and they messed it up and she never cleaned up after herself, which meant that I was always cleaning up after people, but it went so wrong. She went off on me letting me know that we discussed having her stay for three months and that I would need to get off her back until the three months were over. To say that I was stunned would be a gross understatement. I was flabbergasted and I tried to make sure that I heard right and wasn't having auditory hallucinations. I started up the conversation again, but this time she just told me that she had said what she had to say, and whatever I wanted to add was my problem and not hers, and then stormed out. Over the next week, I struggled to wrap my head around the conversation while Emma continued to mess up my house while pretending I didn't exist. I never really spoke to my family about my problems. Whenever we talked, it was mainly to catch up on our lives and then gossip about our parents, but this time, I needed their help. One of the twins suggested calling the police on Emma, but my oldest brother had something different in mind. And after he explained his ideas to me, I was on board as well. I was going to make my house so uncomfortable for Emma. I started by emptying out the freezer. I usually stocked my freezer with food because I love to cook, but I wasn't going to be providing her with food, whether raw or cooked, anymore. I shared most of it with the smaller families in a completely different neighborhood than mine and then gave what I could to the homeless. It made me feel a little weird that I was giving away thousands of dollars worth of food to prove a point, but I needed Emma out of my home. For someone who basically had no money to take care of themselves, she talked a big game. I never thought I'd feel so thrilled seeing her wander around the apartment looking for food and finding just a few condiments. I would order takeout for myself only and make sure she saw when I picked it up or looked into my room and I could feel her agitation increase by the day. I don't know if she did it as revenge, but I went to school one day and came back to my house absolutely trashed. The TV broke and the paint on my very white walls. 
I swear to God, I felt my eyes twitch because I was still paying for the TV. I immediately called the police and after they had arrived and asked me if I wanted to make a case out of it, I did. And immediately she was given an ultimatum to leave my house. She involved her family and they asked to settle the case out of court. My only request was that they paid for all the damages she had done. They agreed and after all of the calculations, I was to be settled for $27,000 which also included the security deposit that I was most definitely not getting back after she trashed the house. Her family getting involved meant bad news for Emma because they were one of those filthy, rich, pompous guys that needed all their kids to be perfect. She only got permission to study at a co-ed university after a lot of promises, most of which she had already broken. As a consequence, she was getting sent to a private Christian university to start all over again. As a little parting gift from me to her, I put her number out on flyers around campus and bars as a phone sex operator. And just imagining the frustration she would be facing made me happy. And that was how I got rid of my roommate from heck. Oh boy, I'm just thinking about the kind of people that would see a phone sex hotline poster. Like what demographic of people would be desperate enough to call that after seeing that flyer? It's gotta be just like some of the saddest people hitting that phone line up, directly reaching this roommate's number trying to get some kind of human connection or some even lower nastier desire. Good luck to them, they might just want to straight up change their number after that. Which in these days, with every account using your phone number for security, that's gonna suck. That said, our next story is messing up his results. I've always heard the term, heck hath no fury like a woman scorned, since I was a kid, because I read a lot, and female rage seemed to be something that lots of writers liked and feared at the same time. I wouldn't know though, I was a peaceful, quiet child who grew up in a peaceful, quiet home. Both of my parents met each other at 19 and have been in love ever since then. My grandparents on both sides also met each other at very young ages and fell in love. And it wasn't the kind of love where they just tolerated each other. No, it was the kind where they genuinely cared for each other and supported each other's dreams and goals and cheered each other in the right direction. I had good role models for the kind of love that most people prayed for. So I wasn't too worried about finding anyone the way most of my mates were. I believed that if someone was for me, they would find me. I almost had a boyfriend in high school, and I really did think that he had the potential to be what I wanted, until I found out that it was a prank between him and his friends to see who could get the most girlfriends in the period of one month. It seems like such a small thing, child's play even, but it stuck with me and took my trust issues from zero to a hundred. I'll blame it on the fact that I grew up incredibly sheltered. I was naive and believed that everyone was inherently good and would treat me the same way that I did them. And I was a good natured and cheery person, so people were naturally drawn toward me, so I expected that they would treat me with as much honesty as I did them. After the incident, I kept to myself, romance wise. I didn't let anyone get close to me in that manner and decided that maybe being single was the perfect way for me to go at least until I was sure of the other person's intentions. It seemed like a good enough plan and I took it with me until I finished high school. I had three siblings, my older brother M, my twin brother N, and my little sister O. We were raised to be very close and to share things with each other. While M was older than my twin and I by five years, O was our Irish twin and was born ten months after us. As I said, I was close with my siblings, and I used to think that we were all the same peas in a pod. We thought very similarly and had similar but distinct habits, and by the time my twin and I were 16, people thought we were all quadruplets in photos. After high school, it was mandatory in our family to learn a trade for a year before going off to college. M had taken after my father to work with cars in his auto shop, and N was doing the same thing. I decided to learn how to sew like my grandmother and things seemed to go really well for me until both my brothers got girlfriends around the same time. It messed with our dynamic a lot and I found that we weren't as close as we used to be. I didn't blame them, if anything I was jealous. I wanted what they had but I was not ready in any way for it. Just before I left for college, my little sister O got a girlfriend as well. 
and that was what made me decide to get myself a boyfriend. College was not a bad experience. My major was psychology and I was doing very well in it. My search for a boyfriend still continued and I knew exactly what I wanted. A man who was in touch with his feminine side, was kind, empathetic, and had a soft temper. These were such simple things that you would think I would find a boyfriend quickly. But I promise you that toxic masculinity thrives so much more in environments with younger people than anywhere else. By my third year of uni, I discovered that I really liked fashion and making clothes for myself and my friends. Of course, I started to post on social media and got a following. Between that and school, I barely remembered that I had a mission to find a perfect boyfriend. One weekend, there was an estate sale and I went there with a few friends. It was bland for me for the first hour because nearly everything seemed to cater to smaller people and I'm on the bigger side of the size spectrum. I was bored and wanted to leave when I saw a man with the most gorgeous pair of pink boots. I raced to him and immediately started bombarding him with questions about what size they were, where he found them, and if he knew where to find the bigger sized clothes. Fortunately, he was a guide. The shoes were not taken and they were just my size and he did know wherever bigger sized clothes were. He personally ushered me there and just watched me go crazy over a dead person's belongings. By the end of the day, I had a massive trash bag full of clothes, shoes, jewelry, and some household items, and I was happy. On our way out, I spotted the man who had helped me out earlier and I went to say thank you to him. We made small talk, and I found that he was a stylist. He had told me that he'd seen my content and found me interesting. It felt good to hear that, and before I knew it, he had asked if he could style me for an event. The event was his date to a party where he styled a lot of influential people and I was starstruck. It was like I'd been transported to another reality that I could only dream of and it made me adore him. By the end of the night, I was drunk on too many glasses of champagne and he kissed me. By the end of the week, he had asked me to be his personal assistant. Juggling being the personal assistant to a busy man like that was hard, especially with having school on the other side, but I managed it. Let's call him L. L was older than me by a decade, but he had a very youthful look to him that would make you think he was much younger. He was good looking, kind, and loved to help young people, but he told me that I was different and that he wanted me around for a very long time, which was why he made me a personal assistant. It didn't make sense to me at first because I wanted to be loved loudly and wholly, and while he seemed to do it, he also didn't appreciate labels. I now know what those words mean and even then it confused me, but I wanted to be understanding and not rush things. After I graduated college, I basically became L's eyes and limbs. He insisted that we moved in together and he seemed to forget how to do every single thing. I did everything from booking appointments to cooking his dinner. It didn't take time for me to become burnt out. After complaining to my sister, she suggested confronting L. I did, and that was the first time he raised his hand to me. I fainted after the first hit and woke up in the hospital. He had told the doctors that I fell and begged me not to say the truth. Eventually I was checked, and the doctor called me a few days later to tell me that I was five weeks pregnant. I was shocked, but it didn't seem like bad news considering that L had apologized and was currently treating me better than he'd ever done since the start of our relationship. When I broke the news to him, he looked pale as a ghost and was silent for the rest of the night. The next day, he sat down and said he couldn't continue with our relationship outside of work and promised to give me some money to terminate the pregnancy. I was livid and hurt and I made sure he knew it with how violently I cussed him out. He didn't care about anything else but getting me out of his house, so he got me a place within the next week and offered to follow me to the clinic. I had been planning to keep the child anyway because, while the man was a jerk, I had lost a cousin from that kind of procedure before, so the fear was still there. My family, while disappointed at the trajectory my life took, were incredibly supportive of me and promised to make life as good as they could. We were no longer in a relationship anymore, but I still worked as his personal assistant. And this man had no pity on me. He worked me so much harder than before, delayed my salary multiple times, and forgot to credit me for jobs that I did on my own. On a random Thursday, 
I showed up to work and found that the studio we worked at was locked. I tried to call L, but he didn't pick up, and I waited until the landlord came to tell me that L moved everything at night and handed the keys over to him. While I was still mulling over the incident, I got a message from a friend of mine that said L was getting married in three weeks. I was walking down the steps, missed a stair, and found myself in the hospital with a broken wrist, sprained ankle, and no more baby. I was numb to everything, and something broke inside me. It was worse because I knew who his wife-to-be was, a model that he worked with frequently because her agency swore that they both just worked so well together, and it should have made sense, but it still didn't. More information I gathered said that they'd been together on and off for about five years, which was two years longer than he and I was. After three days of being in the hospital, I finally got out and started therapy as my doctor recommended, but I was still so bitter and angry. My brother's girlfriends both were around to show their support, and when all three of us got talking, they expressed how they would take revenge if they were in the situation that I was in. It was a silly joke, but I couldn't sleep that night and I mulled over the fact that I probably wasn't the only girl that L did this to. The next day, I had a plan. My older brother's girlfriend was a lab technician and she helped me fake a few doctor reports and test results so that they looked authentic and I made the most gorgeous black revenge dress. Very similar to what Diana wore after her situation with Charles. The wedding was huge and it was at a cathedral. It was dreamy, and people were only met in by invitation. I knew people who knew people, and some people really hated Elle's guts, so getting in as a plus one was not hard at all. Immediately I got in. I knew that I looked out of place, and I loved it. The theme was spring colors, so everyone was in soft pinks and greens and purples, while I just wore black with the smokiest smoky eye I had done in a hot minute. I sat in the back pew and observed everything with a lot of anxiety in my heart, but I couldn't let him get away with all of this. As soon as the priest asked if anyone had anything to say, I raised a hand, left my seat, and walked up to the front. The eyes on me were nerve-wracking, but I mustered up the courage and started to speak. I led with the fact that he gave me HIV. It also got me pregnant and demanded I end the pregnancy. I didn't need to go further because his fiance slapped his face and began screaming and crying while I was escorted out. My sister, her girlfriend, and my brother's girlfriends were all in a car across the street waiting for me, all dressed up, and once I got in, they drove across town to a fancy bar so that we could celebrate our win. The only lie I told was that I got HIV from L. As much as the world had evolved, it would still stigmatize him, and that was the biggest hit I could give to him. He lost nearly all of his clients within a week, and his girlfriend, whose father's fortune was what he started his career on, left him. He attempted to reach out to me to apologize, but I'd already blocked all contact with him and moved on. Funnily enough, my career elevated, and for the right reasons as well, not because of the whole scandal with him. It's been a year since we last communicated, and my life has been amazing since then. How much do you guys want to bet that when they reached out to OP to try to apologize, it wasn't even about apologizing, it was about maybe like trying to grovel and beg to OP to take back what they said about L and try to like fix things still for them. They were probably just trying to hit OP up just to try to get another thing out of them. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. Now, if you want to hear another absolutely crazy revenge story, check out that video on the left. Or if you missed my latest video, check out that video on the right. That said, I'll see you all next time with some more stories.